small segment of the box saga. And again, these are hopefully just to inspire other people to look into this and read it. Though, uh, considered one of the oldest stories in the world and possibly the beginning of written history. This section is um, the first Ragnarok. And the way I understand Ragnarok is like a catastrophe, something that changed human life forever. Um, there was two major Ragnaroks, and this is a quick story of the first one, which took place in Hell, H-E-L, the North Pole. People lived an idyllic life during Paradise Time. There was a mild tropical climate in all the inhabited areas. Food grew in abundance on trees, ready for the picking. After the initial period during which people populated the planet, nothing much changed. The Boxaka does not speak of actual events and individual people during this time. It merely describes a way of living, a system of procreation in a stable society living in a stable, neutral environment. Most actions were highly ritualized and life kept renewing and repeating itself throughout the countless generations. They procreated in their orderly way in the five caste system. The elected women always having children with their men and they in turn elected from the caste above. Their lives were filled with festivals, carnivals, countless ceremonies and rituals described in other parts of the Bach saga. Everybody was related to the All Father in the far north, a true global family. The Earth's axis was perpendicular to the sun, resulting in no seasons. Neither the north nor the south pole were directed away from the sun in winter or towards the sun in summer like they are now. On the North Pole, where the Pirouette family lived, it was always light. It was hell, as we say in the most northern European languages. Clear and light. Hell means clear and light. Standing on the North Pole, the whole universe, the sun, moon, planets, and stars would spin around a person. The Earth's axis was elongated into the galactic axis, which pointed straight at the North Star. Imagine standing on the North Pole, seeing the North Star directly above with the universe spinning around you, the sun turning its circles over the horizon, once a day, every day, and the northern lights raining down from above. One really must have had the impression of being in the center of it all, a true paradise. Life was good and stable, on earth as in the heavens. We lived on our planet, plan et, planet translated as family plan. The plan encoded within the root language. All this natural and spiritual beauty lasted for a very, very long time. This all came to an abrupt end when a disaster struck 50 million years ago, more or less, on the 24th of July, calculated from 2018. In the Bach saga, this is called the first Ragnarok. It was the first destruction of Udenma, the ringland on the North Pole, and the Asar people inhabiting it. The Earth's and the galactic axis tilted in a matter of three months, resulting in the Earth starting to revolve around another point about 23 degrees from the previous one in hell. So it actually says here 50 million, 10,034 years ago. Now, again, I don't know if I, if I can, um, I don't know if I sh should believe that. I don't know how they would have been able to accurately keep track of 50 million years back, but that's what the book says. And it says that the earth shift to what it is now, this 23.4 degree wobble, where the north pole is no longer pointing true north. This signaled the beginning of an ice age and hell froze over. Hence, believe it or not, that's where that term comes from, when hell freezes over. According to the saga, the atmosphere condensed into ice. After this event, all the ringlands in what is now Northern Europe, Russia, and North America were covered in thick layers of ice. Nobody could live there anymore, and those who were not lucky enough to escape their icy fate perished. By a stroke of Ud, or fate, Udenma remained ice-free, but was surrounded by walls of thick, thick ice reaching kilometers high into the sky. The saga calls this the Atlantis period. Okay, so this is crazy, but makes the most perfect sense. 
a lot of people think Atlantis is a myth. Um, and maybe at this point in our culture it is, but that it may have never happened. But I totally disagree. I think that it's been, there's been so many stories made up about it that there, there's all these, you know, tall tales about it. But I think it was a real thing. And I think this Vox Saga called it Atlantis, but the way that, that what that word means to them is all land ice, Atlantis, all land ice, which is when you say the word Iceland right now, and they say Icelandic, which is very close to Atlantic. So uh, I think that all these people looking for Atlantis in their Bermuda Triangle, they're way off base. I think it, it refers to ice. Okay. Atlantis in the root language means all land is ice. If we think about lands, we think, for example, about Finland, Russland, Greenland, Norland, Iceland, England, Scotland, Ireland, Friesland, Estland, Poland, Saxland, and so on. South of the ice, south of the Pyrenees, Alps, and Himalayas, there are no so-called lands. There's Spain, Hindustan, China, other countries, but no lands. In the Box Saga, Atlantis refers to the time period of the Ice Age that occurred with these lands. Very true. In history, the idea of lands and calling them lands came from Northern Europe. It came from up there. That's where it originated. That's why other countries don't call themselves such and such land. The first Ragnarok led to the first fragmentation of the human race. The ringlands of the Vanir south of the ice were cut off from their all-father. The Vanir created ten kingdoms. There was Kina in the east with Peking. P from the ring. As king, Hindustan with Narkasur as king. Tor king with Sultan as the king. The middle west was Rasul. S-U-L, which refers to the sun, and Ra, which refers to the moon. All father and king in one. As king Afrik, A-F-R-I-K-E, K-E, or Africa, with king Soliman, king Solomon. Information on the other five kingdoms has disappeared in the midst of time. So even the term Afrik, or Africa, comes from this ancient, ancient Finnish language, root language. These kingdoms encircle the planet. Often, they were surrounded by deserts, high mountain ranges, and oceans, and therefore relatively isolated from one another. There was some contact in the form of caravans. Van means vanir, all the people outside of the Old North Pole, and kar, K-A-R, refers to the Karl caste, the Ford caste that undertook these long journeys. So caravans were the, were the Vanner people of the Karl caste. Each kingdom developed its own language rooted in the old Van language and well as its own mythology. These mythologies all have many similarities in that they refer to a common origin. Most of them feature a similar paradise where we all originate from with the tree of life in the middle. Its location in the upper region of the planet where the center of the world and the universe is found. Another similarity between these different kingdoms is the king system. Each mythology has its own pantheon of gods relating to the old pirouette family who were close to the heavens and brought life to the planet. Each kingdom developed a caste system similar to the one before the Ice Age. One Allfather was father to everyone in that particular kingdom. Because of this isolation caused by the kingdom having its own all-father, different races characterized by their own unique and specific physical traits developed through time. So what, what the saga is saying is that the system of kingship and of kingdoms comes from fatherhood and grandfatherhood, but that it originated in Northern Europe and that was adopted as people had to leave during the Atlantis time, all land ice time, they all fled and certain fathers of certain castes set up new kingdoms as all fathers. But that whole system, the system, let's say the system of nobility, a system of procreation through um, 
survival and uh, beauty, which is kind of what nobility sort of refers to, originated in Northern Europe, according to this. The caste system within these kingdoms differed on some crucial points with the one in hell as the center of the formal global system. Let's just quickly recap how this initial globe system functioned. There were five castes. On top of the planet, there was the Bach, whose title was Lemminkainen, who had many sons with the women of his harem. These sons had children with the girls from those castes below. Their sons had children with the girls from the castes below that, and so on. The boys from the last caste did not have children, but contributed to the offering system, which will be explained later in the Offer Ring chapter. Lemminkainen had another special lady outside of his harem. She was elected as the healthiest and most beautiful woman on the planet called the Svan. Together, they had many children. The first boy and girl were to be king and queen of the planet, symbolized by Ra, the moon. The twelfth son was to be the next Lemminkainen. The king and queen had no children. The next king and queen would be the first son and daughter of the next twelve son of Lemminkainen. This differed in all the ten kingdoms. The eldest son of the all-father of a kingdom would be king and at the same time have the function of the Lemminkainen to the progenitor. Hellas, H-E-L-L-A-S, Hellas, which is where the word Hellenistic of the Greeks and Hellene came from, but it originated again in Northern Europe. From the North Pole, a meridian line ran south, dividing the planet into two. It extended from As Hell to Hellas, the AS or axis of Hell. So As is axis and Hell is the North Pole, the axis of Hell, which is the modern day Crete. This line went from the North Pole down the planet, down through Europe, down through Romania down through Crete, and then eventually down through Egypt, and so on. It splits Crete into two parts, and where it leaves Crete on the south shore, we find another Klipal, similar to the one on Udin's O in Udinma. Just east of the meridian is the Near East, and west, therefore, the Near West. So what they're saying here, this is pretty pretty crucial, is... <laughs> No one really ever asks, why do we call China the East? And why do we call America the West? Why do we call Russia the East? And why do we call, you know, um, you know, Italy the West? How did we make this, this distinction between East and West? Because we're on a globe. We're on a spinning ball. So how do you, what makes, you know, if you keep going around China, if you keep going towards the East, you come back around to America, the West. So how did we do this? This is how we did it. The original international dateline, the original prime meridian, meridian started in the North Pole. And it was started by these people. And it only makes sense because mapping the globe really can't be officially done if you're not at one of the poles. Because you don't have a reference to the North Pole, to the, to the pole star, to the places in the sky which tell you this is straight up or this is straight down. So it only makes sense that the mapping of the globe, the line, the whole system of lines and longitude came from the people of the North Pole. Okay, so here we go. The kingdom of the Tor, T-O-R, Ki, or K-I, was situated east of the line in Crete. So what they're saying now, the kingdom of Torki, which is what we call Turkey today. The sultan of Torki had a son with the healthiest and most beautiful lady of the kingdom. Their son was destined to be the next sultan. He continued to have more sons with his harem, some of whom were called emir, growing up all to be all, all fathers in the provinces called emirates. The emirs were called, provinces were called emirates. The sons of the emir with the title were called pasha. The sultan of the latter period moved its capital to what we now know as Istanbul. So again, Turkey became Turkey. Capital is Istanbul. The ruler of the kingdom west of the meridian through Hellas, which is now Crete, was called Rasul. Despite the difference in names, the kingdoms 
order and systems, procreation, titles, functions, and rituals were very similar to that of the other kingdoms. The Roman Empire evolved from Rasul. With its mythological all-father figure, Jupiter, the Pope still today resides in St. Peter, St. Peter's Basilica, and Peter is just Jew Peter, Jupiter. The Pope resides in St. Peter's Basilica, albeit missing the initial syllable Jew, J-U, yeah, Jew, and representing a very different mythology. So, Rome is really founded upon the worship of Jupiter. And I think Saturn as well, Saturnia. When these two kingdoms were established just after the start of the Ice Age, the Sultan and Rasul had a shared residence on the capital of Crete, situated on the meridian. The mythologies of the Ten Kingdoms, with their pantheon of mythological figures, depict the manner in which procreation of their respective societies was organized. The pantheon of godly characters was bestowed. The gift of life is similar in all the Ten Kingdoms. Being mythological figures, these gods were immortal. When their representative on earth died, they were merely replaced by someone else carrying the same mythological title. The mythological figure itself does not die. The king is dead, in quotes, long live the king. Very important there that these titles, these, these, uh, these crowns, these titles of nobility that, that would happen is like, you know, the king may die or the queen may die, but the title would be passed on to this next person of, of heir, the next birthright person, and then they would be given that title, which is why something like Buddha is not someone's, it's not his name. His name was Siddhartha Gautama, right? But he was Buddha. Buddha is a title. And same with Christ. Christ is not his name. It is a title and so on and so forth, so forth. Like Abraham is a title, meaning all father, Abrahim, uh, all Brahmin. It's all the same thing. It's a title. The architecture of the centers of the Ten Kingdoms reflected the organization of Udinma and often copied its layout. More on this subject can be found in the chapter Udinma in Paradise Time. Okay, so I'm going to kind of wrap it up with that. Now, it's pretty amazing stuff if you go think about it the mapping of the world the north pole the people that started it the procreative system the caste system the way in which to diversify the gene pool the titles involved the roles involved all these you know were of a of a a natural and spiritual system that is still kind of rippling through our culture today with the ideas of monarchs, kingdoms, sultans, the heads of state, heads of nations, royal families, so on and so forth. But the point is, is that this original system has been uh, diluted, corrupted, lost, changed, and the box saga has actually kept it intact. So I hope people are interested. I hope you guys will look into the box saga. And again, I highly recommend you check out Unslaved Podcast, Michael Tessarian, David Whitehead. Um, and there's two other people. God, I, sh- I wish I could get their names real quick. And so you can check those people out. Okay. One of the guys you can look up is a guy named Jim Chesnar, C H E S N A R, Jim Chesnar. He's got some stuff out there. And then there's another gentleman. His last name is Hagstrom. I think. Hagstrom. I'll have to see. Okay, yeah. So check out Jim Chesnar. And also you can look up Jock, which is J-O-C-K-E. Hagstrom. H-A-G-G-S-T-R-O-M. Jock Hagstrom. They both have a lot of knowledge about this. So look look at those guys. Check out the box. Thank you.